This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Deadly Therapy. In each one of this month's episodes, I detail a case of people seeking help from therapists, gurus, and others. But instead of receiving healing, they become victims. Many people of faith believe strongly in the power of prayer. Some look to ministers, priests, rabbis, and other spiritual teachers to provide help and guidance. When one woman was at her wit's end, caring for her special needs child, she turned to the church for help. But one pastor would take things too far, resulting in a tragedy. This is the case of Terence Cottrell, Death by Exorcism. In early August 2003, Pamela Hemphill noticed a woman struggling with a little boy in a supermarket in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Simply trying to do a bit of grocery shopping, the mother was obviously having a hard time getting the boy to obey her to stay by her side while she shopped. She had to keep stopping to pull him along. Pamela realized fairly quickly that something was different about the child in the way he responded to his mother, or perhaps didn't respond to her. He didn't answer her or look at her, nor was he acting like a typical rebellious child having a meltdown in a grocery store. No, he was unresponsive in a different way, detached and not seeming to understand her simple instructions. He also wasn't speaking, but only uttered a series of grunts that became louder as he started to get more upset at being dragged along. Finally, he exploded into an outburst of screaming. His arms flailed out at his mother, striking her as she tried to contain him. Now people in the store began to watch the scene, and the mother was clearly embarrassed at being unable to control her child's behavior. The boy was no two- or three-year-old toddler who this type of behavior might be expected from, but a full-grown boy of about seven or eight years old. Pamela noticed the manager coming over, she assumed, to ask the mother to take the boy out of the store. This, of course, is what the frazzled mother had been trying to do, with no success. Now the mother seemed on the verge of tears and at a loss for what to do. The boy continued to fight and struggle against her, screaming loudly. Pamela walked over to see what she could do to help. Perhaps it was Pamela's soothing voice and calm demeanor that helped de-escalate the situation enough to allow the boy's mother to get the situation under control. In any case, in a few minutes, they were outside of the store. Pamela comforted the woman, saying that children were a blessing but could also be a challenge. Mothers have a tough job, she emphasized. She didn't judge the mother, but simply tried to show empathy to her. The woman broke down in sobs, and her story came spilling out to the sympathetic woman. Her name was Patricia Cooper, and she was raising her boy Terrence alone. She also had a two-year-old daughter at home. Her son was named after his father, Terrence Cottrell Sr. Everyone called the boy by his nickname, Junior. She and her son's father had split up soon after he was born, and she'd been a single mother ever since. But Junior had shown signs of developmental delays, beginning just after he was a year old. At the age of two, he had been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. According to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, autism is usually diagnosed in children before the age of three. The symptoms commonly exhibited by children with an autism spectrum disorder include delayed speech or no speech at all, problems with social interactions and responding to social cues, and repetitive or obsessive behaviors. As the child grows older, intellectual disabilities may also be revealed. Other issues may arise, including aggression, hyperactivity, attention deficits, and self-harm, although every child is different. Pat told of how she'd struggled to get treatment for Junior, from extra help in school to placing him on medication to help him calm his angry outbursts. He was getting older and bigger and would strike her, sometimes injuring her. He also lashed out at his toddler sister, and she was afraid he might hurt her. She knew he didn't mean to harm anyone, but he just couldn't control his moods. She no longer knew what to do. Junior had been prescribed Ziprazidone, an antipsychotic medication, but it didn't seem to help that much 
or at least not that consistently. Junior was also having behavior problems in school, so much so that at the end of the school year, she had been informed that if Junior's behavior didn't improve, they would not be allowed to accommodate him in the third grade special needs class in the fall. Pat didn't know where to turn or who could help her. She was a single parent with limited resources, and she felt she was all alone in this struggle. So meeting Pamela Hemphill seemed like a godsend to Pat, literally. Pamela invited Pat and Junior to her place of worship, Faith Temple Church of the Apostolic Faith. Faith Temple was a storefront church located in a strip mall on Fond du Lac Avenue. It was a very small congregation, made up of only about a half a dozen families, but they were very close-knit and helped each other out. Pamela said the pastor and congregation could offer spiritual healing for Junior. She told Pat she sensed that Junior's behavior was less about his diagnosis and more about spiritual warfare he was experiencing. He needed the touch of God to cure what was ailing him, she explained. No doctors or medication could heal the way God could, completely and perfectly, she assured Pat. These words came at just the right time for Pat to hear. As stressed, tired, and hopeless as she'd been feeling, Pamela's talk of God's perfect healing gave her hope. She agreed to bring Junior to an evening church service at Faith Temple. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Native. Native creates safe, simple, effective deodorants, body washes, soaps, and toothpastes using trusted ingredients that deliver trusted performance. Native deodorants are formulated without aluminum, parabens, or talc. Their ingredients come from nature, like coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch to absorb wetness. And these deodorants work, lasting through your busiest days. And I love the scents they come in, sure to please your whole family, men, women, and teens. And you know you want your teens smelling fresh, am I right? Well, the girls will love Loco for Cocoa, with scents of coconut and pineapple, while boys might like Make Like a Tree with a clean woodsy scent, or the other way around. Either way, they'll smell great. The teen line is formulated specifically for ages 8 to 18. And of course, Native's most popular scents for adults include coconut and vanilla, my favorite, lavender and rose, citrus and herbal musk, and unscented. I love that they're made with just a few simple clean ingredients that I can feel good about putting on my body. You all know that aluminum found in many deodorants has been linked to some serious health ramifications. Native deodorants may cost a bit more than conventional deodorants, but for me, my health and my family's is worth having that peace of mind. There's no risk to try Native. They offer free shipping and returns. Take advantage of their subscription service to save 17% and choose how often you want your delivery. And Once Upon a Crime listeners can get 20% off their first purchase by visiting nativedeodorant.com and using promo code ONCE during checkout. That's nativedeodorant.com and use promo code ONCE to save 20% off your first purchase. And thanks for supporting the show. Faith Temple of the Apostolic Church was founded in 1977 by Bishop David Hemphill, Pamela Hemphill's husband. Ray Hemphill, the bishop's brother, was a minister at the church as well. Ray Hemphill, who was employed as a maintenance worker, had no formal religious schooling, but had been ordained as a reverend by his brother. He led the prayer services at Faith Temple. Pat began attending church services, bringing Junior for the almost nightly prayer healing services. The congregation stepped in to help and support the single mother. Members arrived at her apartment in a van to transport her and Junior to church. Other members helped with her household chores and babysat her daughter while she was away at services. Services at Faith Temple could last for hours. There was singing and worship, followed by a sermon from Bishop Hemphill. After the first portion of the service was concluded, the prayer service would begin. Each member who requested it was prayed over by the rest of the congregation for their specific needs. Reverend Hemphill decided that Junior needed a special type of prayer, a laying on of hands, to heal the boy from his affliction. For you see, Ray Hemphill was convinced that what the boy was suffering from was not a developmental disorder, but a demonic possession. He believed that a spirit of evil was inside of the boy. He told Pat that he could cast out these demons through special prayers. Pamela Hemphill told Pat that she herself had been possessed by a demon in her youth. 
She'd been cured through a spiritual exorcism performed on her in the 1970s. Hearing about this, Pat thought perhaps it was true that Junior was possessed by an evil entity. She'd seen her son, a sweet boy at times, turned into a different child when he became enraged. He was becoming stronger and harder to control. Perhaps some evil was present in him that caused such drastic behavior, she thought. Hearing Pamela's story of healing and the assurances of Reverend Ray that spiritual warfare could help her son gave her hope for the first time in a long time. So Pat brought Junior to church at least three times per week in August of 2003. The reverend and congregation put all of their focus on healing Junior from his demons. They prayed over him for hours, asking God to release the evil that had taken over his body and mind and to replace it with God's love and light. It is almost certain that neither the reverend nor the church members had any knowledge or experience with a person diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Junior responded to their efforts by kicking his feet and punching and scratching at them. He had limited ability to express the emotions he was feeling, whether it was boredom, frustration, or feeling overwhelmed by the long prayer services. When he responded by lashing out physically, the congregation took this as another sign of demonic possession, and they redoubled their efforts to administer spiritual healing. After two weeks of prayer sessions with little improvement in Junior's behavior, Reverend Ray said that the demons attacking Junior were too strong for the usual methods to be effective. He believed that an exorcism needed to be performed for the boy to be released from his tormentors. Luckily, the reverend was on a summer break from his job as a school maintenance worker and had time to perform this service. Pat agreed to allow Reverend Ray to begin performing this ritual on her son. Over the weeks, Pat's neighbors noticed that she looked even more tired, haggard, and unkempt, as did her children. They knew that she was attending church regularly now and that the members were constantly at her house when they weren't driving her to church. They wondered if she wasn't being indoctrinated into some kind of brainwashing or cult by her new friends. Maybe it was just all the late-night prayer services she was attending that were exhausting her, but it was hard to say, and her friends were concerned. Truth be told, the prayer services were draining. Junior continued to fight them at every turn, and they had resorted to sometimes physically restraining him as they prayed over him. They would hold his arms and legs down as he lay on the floor, removing his shoes so he couldn't kick them. But the exorcism service was even more intense. Junior, already tired of the constant praying over him he was forced to undergo, had to be brought kicking and screaming to the church. He was then laid on the floor, his arms and legs held down. Ray Hemphill would then lay his 160-pound body over the 8-year-old and whisper into the boy's ear, demanding that the demons leave his body, while a handful of other church members prayed above them. At the first of these sessions, Junior was docile, perhaps shocked or frightened by the full-grown man who sometimes sat on the boy's chest or sometimes lay with his entire body over him. But when Hemphill moved off of the boy, Junior began to fight once again. Other members, including Junior's mother Pat, were enlisted to hold his limbs down while Hemphill began once more calling Satan out of the boy's body while lying over him. Pat said she once heard a demon speaking through her son's mouth, hissing, Kill me! Take me! After a while, likely physically exhausted, Junior would go quiet and become docile. Pat, hoping and believing that her boy was being cured, would then take the tired boy home. But soon enough, Junior's angry outbursts would begin once again. This is not to say that Junior's behavior was problematic 100% of the time. Neighbors said that he could just as often be happy and was a funny, goofy boy when in a good mood. He liked to visit his neighbor, who gave him newspaper that he would fold into kites and other objects. He showed affection by throwing punches at people. His father, Terrence Sr., said Junior liked to play box with him, and they had good times together. Junior liked to roughhouse with his father, who was a big man, Unlike others, Terrence Sr. wasn't afraid that the little boy would be too rambunctious and inadvertently hurt him. But it's likely that the church had become a trigger for Junior. It was a place he didn't want to be, and he was overwhelmed by the constant praying over him. Junior's condition caused him to be uncomfortable with too much social interaction, especially in the presence of strangers. On top of this, he was being physically restrained for long periods of time, which frustrated him. 
he was unable to communicate this frustration except through acting out physically. But instead of understanding how uncomfortable all of this was for the boy, the reverend blamed his acting out on demons and continued to subject him to the makeshift exorcisms. The sessions continued over the next week, but still Pat saw no improvement in Junior. Finally, on Friday night, August 22nd, a small group of members met at the church. Reverend Ray was determined that this time the demons would be cast out and Junior would be released once and for all. It was a hot night, the end of a blazing hot day, where temperatures reached over 100 degrees in Milwaukee. The church had no air conditioning, and the electric fans did little to cut through the humidity in the sweltering room. As Junior was led by the hand into the church, he was uncharacteristically quiet. He was brought in front of the altar and sat on the floor. His shoes were removed from his feet. As Reverend Ray knelt down beside the boy and began to pray, Junior started flailing his arms and kicking his feet. He didn't want this man near him, it was obvious. He just wanted to be left alone. The congregation took his response to mean that the demons inside him were angered by the reverend's prayers. The other adults present got into position. They decided to cover Junior's body with a sheet before pinning his arms and legs to the ground so that he couldn't scratch at them. Two women each held down one leg. Pat held down her son's left arm. Ray Hemphill lay on top of Junior, holding his head and right arm down to the floor. He began to pray and then repeated phrases intended to call out the evil entity. They also employed a method to squeeze the devil out of the boy's body. One woman would periodically push down on Junior's abdomen as Hemphill lifted some of the weight off of his chest. After about an hour, with Ray Hemphill laying over his body, they noticed that Junior had gone quiet. His mother would later say that she'd heard strange noises coming from him and that he'd urinated on himself. But since he was no longer fighting, she thought that the demons might finally be leaving him and that the exorcism was working. Hemphill, drenched in sweat from the hot, muggy room and his exertions to cast out the evil from Junior, finally lifted himself off of the boy. Junior, too, was bathed in sweat. He was also still. Then, to everyone's horror, they realized that his face was blue. He was no longer breathing. Hemphill began CPR as an ambulance was called. But it was too late. Junior could not be revived. Eight-year-old Terence Cottrell Jr. was pronounced dead at the hospital. An autopsy would conclude that he'd died from mechanical asphyxiation due to external chest compression. He'd been suffocated due to the weight placed upon his chest during the exorcism. Investigators at first asked for a charge of homicide to be brought against Ray Anthony Hemphill. But the district attorney's office said they couldn't prove Hemphill's actions were likely to kill the boy, so they settled for the charge of child abuse recklessly causing great bodily harm. This could have him spending five years in prison and five years of court supervision. While this might seem like a light sentence for the homicide, intentional or not, of a little boy, prosecutors were forced to tread lightly due to the unusual circumstances of the crime, namely that it had occurred during a religious practice or service. Because of the free exercise clause of the First Amendment of our Constitution that states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Defendants who commit a crime in the name of religion are often charged differently, if at all, than other defendants. Ministers like Ray Hemphill can sometimes use the defense of religious freedom as a get-out-of-jail-free card for some offenses. But smothering to death an eight-year-old is not allowable under any circumstances, whether they intended to harm him or not or even if they believed they were helping him. The prosecutors decided to go for a lesser charge in order to not have the jury balk at the thought of convicting a minister on a murder charge. Some of the rhetoric that came out after the boy's death seemed heartless and inexcusable. While neither Ray Hemphill nor Junior's mother made any statements to the press, both Bishop David Hemphill and his wife Pamela spoke freely to the media. Quote, 
The boy just had a problem in his mind, and what we were doing was asking God to fix it, said the bishop. He chose to fix it by taking him back home to him. All I know is we're not guilty of anything, unquote. Asked if he felt his brother bore any responsibility for Terrence Jr.'s death, Hemphill answered, If I lay down on somebody and they pass away, God took him. I didn't. Some question whether Ray Hemphill could even use the defense that he'd been ministering to the child at the time of his death. Wasn't it true, they asked the bishop, that his brother had no formal religious school or training? How then could he have ordained him as a minister? He answered, if a person believes that the King James Version of the Bible is the Word of God, you just read it, and you just believe it. It's nothing that you have to go to school for. If you believe it, that's it. Pamela Hemphill told reporters that her brother-in-law's techniques of laying across Junior's body came right out of the Bible. The Book of Kings, chapter 17, verse 21, reads, And Elijah stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. Apparently, Pamela didn't see the irony in using this scripture to defend her brother-in-law. Elijah was trying to help a child who was so sick that there, quote, was no breath left in him, unquote. Not a child who was kicking and screaming and being called possessed. Ray Hemphill's trial began in July of 2004. No one else was charged with contributing to the death of Terrence Cottrell, Jr. The three women, including his mother, Pat Cooper, did not testify. They all pled the fifth, advised by their attorneys of their right not to incriminate themselves on the stand. Hemphill's defense placed the blame with Junior's mother. She was the one who had brought the boy to the church, they reminded the jury. Pat Cooper had also allowed the exorcism sessions to take place and to continue over several weeks. Surely, a mother who thought her son was in danger wouldn't have done so, they reasoned. This, the attorney said, proved that neither Hemphill nor anyone else believed the boy was being subjected to any harm. The defense also tried to say that it wasn't as a result of Hemphill's actions that Junior had died, but because of the prescription medications his mother had been giving him. The defense presented a toxicology report stating the medical examiner found toxic levels of antihistamine, bromphenaramine, and dextromethorphan, two chemicals commonly found in cough medicine. It was these drugs combined with the antipsychotic medication, ziprazidone, which the defense called an experimental autism drug, that caused Junior to stop breathing, they claimed. In the end, the jury didn't buy it, and after deliberating for four hours, they found Raymond Hemphill guilty of felony physical abuse of a child, causing great bodily harm. The prosecutors saw it as a win, but Terrence Sr. felt the minister got away with murder saying he should have been charged with manslaughter or murder from the beginning. He, however, said he was glad that the man would serve time in prison for the death of his son. At his sentencing, the judge said, All Terrence Jr. could do was struggle, and you interpreted that as demonic. It was your unreasonable and reckless conduct that caused this child to die. Hemphill was sentenced to two and a half years in prison and seven and a half years of supervised release. The judge also imposed a fine of $1,224.75 in restitution. So little? And for what? To whom? So many questions. Finally, the judge also prohibited Hemphill from performing exorcisms until he received, quote, extensive training, unquote, in this ritual. This seemed like a bizarre restriction, unless you know that during his pre-sentencing interview, Ray Hemphill was asked by the court if he would ever perform another exorcism to which he answered that he absolutely would. He was convinced he had a gift from God to cast out demons. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Next week, I'll be back with the final chapter of Deadly Therapy, and it will be a little bit different. In the next episode, a woman claims abuse at the hands of her psychologist husband and takes deadly revenge. Was it self-defense or cold-blooded murder? I hope you'll join me next week for that story. I just held a live show where I presented a story of a little-known serial killer that hunted his victims in my hometown of San Jose, California. The recording of that show will be released on Patreon, and you can hear it and a dozen other bonus episodes by becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime and join for as little as $2 per month. 
Thanks to all of you who are already patrons. Be looking for that bonus episode in your feed soon. I also just released episode six of Let's Talk About True Crime. On it, I discuss the eight-part miniseries, The Act, a dramatized version of the Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose Blanchard case. You'll hear me and my little Scottish friend Jane talk about that, as well as stupid criminals while Jane drops liquor bottles and munches chips into the microphone. It's a wild ride, and I hope you'll join us. Here's a clip from that show. In this movie, just to give you a couple of the the actors that play um, Claudine or Dee Dee, which is Gypsy's mother, played by Patricia Arquette. And uh, she does not look like she normally looks <laughs> at all. Because I kept saying, who is that? I know I've seen that actress, but I can't remember where. Because when you see her, you know, in other things or in real life, she looks nothing like that. She looked to me to be like a person who would show up at J.C. Penny because, you know, of the, the you know, the pinafers and the, oh, okay, yeah. the embroidered denim. Oh, uh, yeah. No, yeah. She was very much a, a, a what do you call it? Kind of uh, wholesome looking, yeah, like, I would say, right? L- like one of those, you know, you wear those, uh, what do you call those? Like, yeah, the embroidered vests, so right. sweater vests. So J.C. Penny, summer line. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like sensible shoes. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. The turtlenecks. Tur- yeah. <laughs> yes, turtlenecks. <laughs> <laughs> so what we see in the beginning is that you fl- they flash back to the family, um, to Gypsy and Dee Dee moving into this house. Um, so they, like you said, they moved from Louisiana because supposedly the hurricane happened, destroyed. J.C. Penny. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to find a new place to shop. So. <laughs> so. Luckily, she still had her pinnifer packed, so that was okay. Pinnifer is that a Scottish <laughs> word? I don't even know what the hell that a is. denim pinnifer? It's like a dress, but uh, it kind of looks like prison outfit from <laughs> like a female, like a cell block each woman, women's present prison outfit, which was an Australian soap <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> If you like that and want more, subscribe to Let's Talk About True Crime wherever you listen to podcasts. That's Let's T-A-C-O About True Crime. There are links to it in the show notes. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Additional research help was provided by Lorena Garcia for this episode. Until next time, be good to one another.